And please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. We're moving along at a whirlwind pace through Acts. We will not be finished with it by the end of this year. But while you're turning there, let me mention a couple of series that have begun, and that would be an important thing for you to be part of Sunday evenings. We have begun a series in Proverbs. And um, in church, in church services, I've never preached through Proverbs before. I was thinking about us uh, preached through most of the Bible about you know, at least five times. But Proverbs in church, I've never preached through. I've preached it for the teenagers, for the youth group, lots of times over the years. I've never preached through Proverbs in church service. And uh, it would be a real help to you if you come be part of that series. I think you'd learn a lot. And, uh, man, I'll tell you something. It's just wonderful to be able to live wisely. That is, not needing to learn from your mistakes, but learning from the Word of God instead. And, man, I'll tell you, it's, it's just so effective. Time and uh, expense and consequence to just do right because you knew what the right thing was versus doing right because you found out what didn't work. And you know, a lot of people live that way. They just, you know, they try the wrong thing and it doesn't work. And so they try something else and it doesn't work and then eventually they try the right thing. Proverbs tells us how to live wisely. And you can avoid a lot of problems. Uh, a couple of things that are vital uh, teachings of Proverbs are relationships. You want to have good relationships with people, and you ought to. You should want to have good relationships with people. Proverbs will teach you how to do that. Uh, finances. You want to not have financial problems, and that would be good. Proverbs will teach you finances. Uh, wise behavior, living for eternity, how to live in a way that matters, and to how to live wisely. Uh, Proverbs will teach you how to do that. And so I want you to know about that by way of opportunity so that you can be part of it. And also, uh, we've also begun a new series on Wednesday evenings in Daniel. And there's a lot of prophecy in Daniel. We'll be looking at actually this Wednesday evening. We'll be skipping ahead just a little bit. And we're going to be looking at how the wise men knew when Jesus would be born. And uh, that's... A lot of Christians don't know how the wise... Why did the wise men... Uh, come to Jerusalem seeking the king when they came seeking a king. Well, because the Bible told them exactly when Jesus would be born. And so we'll be looking at that on our, in our Christmas service this Wednesday evening, and that'll be worth your while. I think every Christian ought to know, I think that is the, the most detailed, most accurate prophecy which was fulfilled in the Scripture by Jesus Christ. And if you'll come Wednesday evening, uh, you'll be able to be helped with that and be able to really be a help for a lot of people. There are many, many Grinches out there uh, nowadays. Anybody notice that? Now, they, the Grinches aren't anything new. People that hate Christmas and the idea of Christmas, or people that are so negative in their personality that they jump on the misinformation bandwagon anytime something negative comes up. And unfortunately, in Christianity, there's a lot of that. A lot of people that are on the, hey, let's don't celebrate the greatest event that ever happened to the world bandwagon. You guys seen it lately? I Man, I see it everywhere. Like, you know, the greatest thing that ever happened in the world, let's let's make light of it, or let's denigrate it, or let's point out only the things that are done wrong and not the things that are right about it. And so it'd be good for us as Christians to be informed. You might be an anti-Christmaser, and that's okay with me. Um, I honestly have rubbed shoulders with a lot of anti-Christmasers, and I'm a bit of a Scrooge myself. Uh, personality-wise, but the fact of the matter is that anytime God has ever done anything great, He's wanted men to remember it. Anytime God did something spectacular for the nation of Israel, He always had them make a memorial. Remember they crossed the Red Sea? What they do? Pile up a stone for every one of the 12 tribes. So when their kids would look at it, uh, they'd say, what happened here? Why are these big rocks here piled up like this? Well, this is when our nation would have been wiped out but God did a miracle and saved us. We crossed the Jordan River by our rocks. Uh, Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt, and they were supposed to leave that for a memorial. There are all these memorials that God wanted to, uh, 
wanted the nation of Israel to have so that the children would say, what happened here? And then, of course, anytime God did something great, like bringing the children of Israel into the promised land, remember? He wanted them to, uh, to celebrate with the Feast of Booths, camp outside. I want you, for seven days a year, I want you to stay outside to remember when you didn't have a permanent home. For a memorial, so that you can remember what God has done. But you know, the greatest thing that God's ever done, He wants us to forget. Not being sarcastic about that, of course. But uh, we're going to celebrate Christmas this week. And, and, and listen, don't, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, as the saying goes. Just because people uh, buy into the commercialization of Christmas, or just because people celebrate Santa Claus instead of Jesus, just because people do things that detract from the truth, we as believers need to be the individuals that just really celebrate the truth. And so, let's celebrate it. And, uh, you know, celebration's fun, actually, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I, religion oftentimes, sometimes takes the approach of austerity. And, uh, oh, don't do that. Don't, you know, don't do this, don't do that, whatever. And, uh, you know, that's a real turnoff sometimes as well. Celebration's actually fun. And God made us that way. He made us to be able to enjoy things. And so, just give you a little bit of encouragement about that there. Now, would you please, if you're in Acts chapter 22, if you would do me the favor of looking back, if, if like in my Bible, chapter 21 is in the near uh, portion, uh, I would like to read, actually, up to our text, I would like to read beginning in verse 17 and read down through verse 20. The Bible says, In the day following, Paul, following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had brought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Oh, and let's read, let's read verse 21. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Now will you please go with me to chapter 22. Uh, Paul said he's speaking to the Jews in Jerusalem at large, not necessarily the believing brethren. He says, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And we'll just stop there and pray for God's help, and then we'll go through the dialogue of Paul's testimony to his countrymen, the Jews. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for this book that we know is inerrant. And not just inerrant in the originals, but God, that book that we know that you promised to preserve so that we could have it, and so that we could believe it, and so that your Spirit could teach it to our hearts. Now today I ask that you would grant us understanding. God, be with each of us with our ability to comprehend and our ability to remain focused. And I pray that for the next several minutes that you would impart to us truth that would help us to have a better understanding of how we ought to testify of Jesus Christ in us and how we ought to perceive or view religion uh, versus truth and that you would help us to practically know how to live as a result. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Paul's gone to Jerusalem. If you were to read, uh, really from where we left off last week, when he stopped uh, on a little island and called for the elders of Ephesus to come and meet with him there so that he could give them last instructions. See, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And this portion of Acts that we're in follows the outline, of course, that they were supposed to preach according to Acts 1.8, the gospel in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, the regions around Jerusalem, and then under the uttermost part of the earth. The third part of the gospel was largely tasked or entrusted to the Apostle Paul and those who journeyed with him. Now we know that there were several of the ones that we would, today we would call them missionaries, individuals that were sent out to go to other places. Barnabas and Silas would have been individuals. John Mark, last week in our context, we looked at uh, the, how there were nine people actually that were traveling with this group of Paul that were heading back to Jerusalem. 
But Paul had become the apostle to the Gentiles. Now he preached the gospel everywhere. He saw Jews saved everywhere that he went. But Paul never really, never really won anyone at Jerusalem. Never really had an audience at Jerusalem. Matter of fact, uh, after he had been converted, after he had uh, met Jesus face to face, essentially, and become a believer in Jesus Christ and been taught of Christ, he went back to Jerusalem and was integrated with the apostles. The apostles accepted him. They understood that Jesus had chosen him as well to be an apostle. And so now, Paul's back at Jerusalem, but one of the things that he has been called to do, one of the things God's gifted him for, is to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And Paul, in Jerusalem, disputed with the Greeks, trying to teach them Jesus is the Christ, and it caused dissension. It caused an argument, so much so that the church had unrest. It stirred everybody up, and everybody's mad at the believing Jews in Jerusalem. And it was all happening because Paul's trying to reach the Greeks in Jerusalem, which he was gifted for. Ultimately, what happened was that the church decided when they started trying to kill Paul, we better get him out of town. And they basically sent Paul away. He went back to Tarsus and almost was exiled there as far as the church is concerned. He, he's an apostle, called to be an apostle, but he had no effective ministry. He's exiled at Tarsus until the great uh, turning of the Gentiles to Jesus Christ happened at Antioch. And Barnabas, remembering Paul's passion for the Gentiles and Paul's desire to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, went and got Paul and brought him to Antioch. And that's when Paul's ministry really began. Now, I said all that to say this. Paul never had a very good ministry at Jerusalem. And now he's going back to Jerusalem. On his way there at Ephesus, the Holy Spirit told the people that he was meeting at, the pastors that he was warning about, this is going to be our last meeting. They told Paul, hey, you know, you go to Jerusalem, you're going there to be bound. You're going there to be in prison. Don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. Then the next place he stops at, uh, by the Holy Spirit, he's warned, you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound. And Paul ultimately says, hey, I know this. Why are you weeping? Why are you trying to break my heart? I know this is going to happen. I'm going because I'm already bound in the Holy Spirit and I'm willing to die at Jerusalem. I, if it's my time to depart and this is God's will for me, I'm willing to die. Now, sure, Paul, we know the rest of the story already, that Paul was going to Jerusalem en route to Rome. One of the places that when Paul was saved and Ananias was told that Paul is going to be an apostle to me, he's going to preach the gospel. One of the places he's going to preach to is to kings and them that are in high places. And the highest place in that day would have been the emperor of Rome. And Paul eventually, we'll see, the next couple weeks actually appeals to Caesar. But there's an interesting little dialogue in the chapters between when we, when we looked at Paul last week going to Ephesus and giving his last words to the pastors, the elders at Ephesus, and, and where we're at here today. Now I read on purpose the text in Acts chapter 21 where when Paul went back to Jerusalem, he met with James. Now, this is James, a brother of Jesus Christ. This is James, who has now really become uh, the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. And he's meeting there with the other apostles. And now Paul is back for the first time in forever. Not forever, but for a long time. And he updates them on how the gospel has traveled to the uttermost part of the earth. And I can't stop being amazed by that. If you understand the reality that the king of the Jews is acknowledged to be who he is, the savior of the world, by more Gentiles today than even Jews. There are a lot of Jewish believers today. But by more Gentiles, it's the absolute, one of the most astonishing things in the world is the last part of the Great Commission. We mentioned this, didn't we, the last couple of weeks. If you were to vote not from our perspective, but from the first century perspective, on how likely the last part of the Great Commission was to succeed. That is, the uttermost part of the earth part of the Great Commission. To preach that the King of the Jews is the Savior of the world, and to have the world follow a Jewish king. And if you were to guess, especially in the age, especially in the day uh, where the Roman Empire is dominating the world, how effective that gospel would be my friend, we'd all agree that it's only through the power of God. 
that the gospel went forth in such a way. It's amazing, isn't it? So now Paul is back in Jerusalem. He's reporting on how the gospel's gone to the uttermost part of the earth. All the known world has heard the gospel at that time. Now, I, I mentioned this. I can't stop talking about it. But I even mentioned last week about how amazing, if you look at regions of the world uh, where the gospel was preached in the first century, and you look at Jerusalem being the, the center, being the hub that the gospel went out of, and you look at how far away the United States of America is, isn't it amazing, the reach of the gospel? Isn't it amazing uh, that, you know, there are a lot of regional religions around the world, you know this. But you know, following Jesus isn't like that at all. It's the uttermost part of the earth because Jesus is the Savior of all men. It's not religion. It's God. It's a wonderful truth. It's a wonderful thing. Now, so Paul has gone to Jerusalem, and he has, after he updates the he updates James and the elders at Jerusalem on how the gospel's going, how the Gentiles are receiving the gospel around the world, they rejoice, we saw, but then they also inform him of a concern which they have. Now, I'm not here to comment on them or to say anything at all, but just to simply say in verse 21, here's what they said that the Jews that believe at Jerusalem were informed. Verse 21, They are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children neither to walk after the customs. What is it there for? And then they give him the suggestion that he take an oath, which had to do with the law of Moses, so that the Jews would know that he's not teaching the Gentiles to hate the law of Moses. That's basically what they're saying. Now, let me ask you a question. <laughs> is it really Paul's responsibility here to defend himself, actually? I don't want to get too much into the commentary, but I can't help myself very much. I just wonder whether or not the elders of Jerusalem might have done a better job at handling or dispelling the untrue rumors. We're privy to Acts 15, right? To the church at Jerusalem getting together when the Judaizers tried to make the Gentiles keep the law as a requirement for evidence of their salvation. And how that ultimately... They were informed, I like the word today, they were informed that they weren't saved by the law. No, no person who was obligated, that is, they're Jews, and they, the law of Moses is the law that they have covenanted with God to keep. No Jew who had covenanted to keep the law of God kept it, but they still needed a Savior, and they needed to be saved how? By grace through faith. By faith. So they said, we're saved by faith. We couldn't keep the law. So now we're going to take Gentiles who are saved the same way we are. They're saved what? We're saved by faith. They're saved by faith. And we're going to try to get them to keep a law that we couldn't keep. And so they all decided, hey, let's don't lay an unnecessary burden on them. You go back to Acts 15 and read this if you don't recall. Don't lay an unnecessary burden on them. Just tell them, don't be pagan. Don't be godless. Don't, don't uh, eat things, meat that's offered to idols. Don't eat things strangled. And keep yourself from fornication. Those all were idolatrous behaviors. So don't be a pagan. You don't have to keep the law, but don't be, don't be a heathen. And by a heathen, we're talking about somebody that worships devils. Worships false gods. Don't worship any god but God. And that's all there is to it. Now those are the facts, actually, aren't they? And I don't know the, the details of this. Maybe no one could answer for Paul, but for Paul himself. But the accusation here, which actually leads to Paul getting in trouble, is coming not from unbelieving Jews, but from believing Jews. In other words, Paul's vow that he's taking with four men who are believers, he's going to shave his head and he's going to take the vow, and it's going to be for the, for the feast that's up and coming. He's doing it to pacify believing Jews. Did you ever notice that? He's not doing it to win unbelieving Jews. And it is not the believing Jews who now say or accuse Paul. Uh, later on, they accuse him of bringing a guy from Ephesus into the temple. It wasn't true. Paul didn't do that. But they said, you brought a Gentile into the temple. And that was the accusation that was made against him. They started this whole uproar. And I can't summarize it all for us today. 
But now we find Paul being actually put in chains, and they don't know what he's done yet, but the Jews were trying to kill him, and then the uh, the ruler, the Roman ruler, came and saw him trying to be saw them trying to kill him, and so they put him in chains. We don't know what he's done, and then they had to escort him. They're escorting him up the steps into this place, and Paul said, "Can I stop? Can I address the people?" And that's where we pick up our text today, where Paul says, "Men and brethren." And he begins a very polite discourse. Now, for our benefit today, I just want to focus on the delivery of the message that Paul preached to his countrymen who are comprised with unbelieving Jews. And of course, the caveat that we brought up at the beginning, and I know you, everybody looks so tired this morning. I'm so sorry. I wish you all had more coffee. I wish you would had more sleep. But I can't give you any of those right now, so just bear with me as, as much as you can. Uh, but the caveat here is that all this problem which is being created for Paul has actually happened as a result of his taking a vow to pacify believing Jews who have falsely accused him of teaching that Gentiles should just throw away the law of Moses. Now, again, there's some doctrinal teaching here for people that are confused. You know, there's third New Testament believers that, that teach today Old Testament. It's not for us. It's nothing there. It's not part of the Scripture anymore. It's not our Scripture. And uh, evidently, Paul was not teaching that. Didn't want to teach that. Does everybody understand that? By understanding we're not saved by the law, we're not throwing away the law. It's God's law. God gave it to Moses, and it's God's law. And so Paul wants to convince it. But it's interesting that it is believers who have put Paul in this position that has gotten him the attention from the unbelievers. And ultimately, we know who is behind the scenes, don't we? We know who is actually working everything for good. And that's God. Let me just give you a little help with this. You know, God can save a life, and God can allow a life to, like Stephen's to be given for his service, for his good. And some people say, well, you know, you know what, it's all part of God's plan anyway. Well, listen, just let me just tell you something. I don't want to be part of the evil in God's plan. Have you ever met a person that just thinks, well, you know, I, you know, it's just you know, it's all going to happen anyway. Well, I don't have to be the evildoer in God's plan. Does that make sense to you? And I wouldn't want to be the people that are responsible for Paul being put to death because of an accusation that I made or because of wrong that I had done. In spite of the fact that God knew exactly what He was doing when He was sending Paul to preach the gospel in Rome. All right, so that's just a caveat, and I hope that's a, that's a helpful declaration for you here today. Go to chapter 22 now, and I want to look at a couple of things about Paul's message or Paul's speech to his countrymen that I think would be a, a real help for us. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 when Paul talks about, I have become all things to all men so that I might by all means or by any means save some? Here's Paul making a good example. Paul is known as the apostle to whom? Gentiles. The Gentiles. And Paul has gotten into this problem because he's been accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple. And so what we have here is a very, very clear, focused hatred of Gentiles and a very focused hatred of Paul. And I just want to look at how Paul answers and how Paul defends himself because I believe that sometimes as Christians, we're way more abrasive than we need to be. I believe sometimes as Christians we do more to harm the cause of the gospel because of what we say. But there's a flip side to that as well. I think sometimes as Christians we do nothing because we're afraid of giving offense at the same time. And so I want to look at two things today that I think are helpful. I want to look first of all at the way that Paul becomes a Jew to the Jews so that he can win the Jews. We know his heart to the Jews. You could read Romans 7 through 12 sometime and see Paul wanted his brethren, his countrymen, the Jews, to be saved. Paul loved the Jews. Paul was a Jew. So, first of all, we're going to see how that Paul identifies with his brethren. In verse 2, when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he said. Now, right before this, when Paul is speaking to, when he is speaking to, of uh, the, the centurions who took him prisoner, he spoke to them in Greek so that they know that he knows them. 
And now he's speaking to the Jews, and he's speaking in what language? Hebrew. He's speaking in Hebrew. Now, this is not a Bible doctrine I'm teaching here today, but you know that trying to relate to people uh, gives you a much better audience. It just does. My wife laughs her head off when I try to speak another language to someone. She thinks it's really funny like when I try to speak Spanish to somebody who speaks Spanish. And she really laughs. She'll laugh right in front of me, right in front of them, whatever. But you know what I found? Trying to speak Spanish to someone who speaks Spanish is appreciated. They love it that I try. I, I'll knock on doors. The person will be like, hey, no, no, speak English. And I'll try to speak Spanish to them, and they'll start speaking English. Because they'll be like, well, this isn't going to work, and you're not going away. And so, <laughs> go ahead and whatever. But, you know, we can have a conversation, and what gets the conversation is the person actually wants to speak to me because they know that I know that I care enough to try to speak to them. And Paul is speaking to his Hebrew countrymen, and he speaks Hebrew to them. And the Bible says they kept the more silence. They listen. You know, sometimes people don't listen because of our demeanor. This whole, hi, I'm Ryan, I'm from Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, and I just want to ask you today, if you were to die, would you burn in hell or would you go to heaven? It's probably, I mean, that's almost the way the presentation of the gospel for some people is. You know, I'm a religious nut, and I'm here to judge you. I mean, I'm just not talking about the facts, I'm talking about what people perceive to be the fact, and that's the same thing in their mind anyway. And here we find Paul being very, very careful in how he answers his countrymen because he's not just trying to defend himself and he's not just trying to put them in their place. He's trying to win them. And so he speaks to his countrymen in Hebrew. And the Bible says when, he heard, when they heard that he spoke in Hebrew, they kept all the more silence. That is, they began to listen. And Paul does everything that he can. Now, now, just because somebody hears you does not mean that they'll receive the truth. But, you know, you get a lot further with somebody hearing the truth than where you're just saying, well, if they want to hear it, they'll come, and they'll come with the right attitude, and then I'll share it with them. No. We do everything we can to not be a hindrance to the gospel. That's precisely what Paul's doing. Now Paul tries to identify with them. I shouldn't say... He tries to. Paul relates to them. You know, one of the things that people have a problem with oftentimes is they think that you don't know what they're thinking. They think you don't understand what they're thinking. And boy, I'll tell you something. In our country, uh, dialogue has degenerated to the, to, to the degree that, I mean, you can't even have a conversation with somebody that doesn't already agree with you. It's gotten bad, hasn't it? It's gotten really bad in our country. And uh, you know what I try to do on purpose? If I do this with you, please don't be offended with me. But I think that we need to take some ground back when it comes to getting along with people we don't agree with. I think we just need, I think some civility would be in, uh, it would be right, wouldn't it? You know, being right and uncivil isn't right, and being wrong and uncivil isn't right. Some civility would be good. So here's what I do now, and I recommend that you do the same, and I'll, I'll inspect you and see how you survive it next week. So if I'm standing in line, and a bunch of us are forced to be in a place like, you know, for instance, um, has anybody ever gone to the tag office? It's quick, right? In and out. You know. Send that one ever. <laughs> no, you're going to be there for a while. You're in for it. And I'm usually the designated tag office person. I did get my wife uh, to go with me recently, and she didn't like the two hours that it took to sit there at all. And I, I think she has a greater appreciation for the perils that I endure out of my love for her uh, at times. But anyway... Uh, if I go to the tag office and there's a bunch of people there, and there are some people who, whose cell phone, they, you, you could be in the tag office long enough that your cell phone battery will die. <laughs> and you got nothing to do. And so there's a bunch of people, they, their cell phones are dead, and they're still there, and they're grumbling, they're not happy. Here's what I say. Let's have a discussion about politics and religion. <laughs> <laughs> And then I get a big old grin on my face just like that. You'd be amazed how many great discussions I get into. And I just established the ground rules. Let's be civil about it. Let's like each other. It's just incredible how you can actually make headway with people. And then you can ask the questions, are those the facts? What are the facts? You can just ask, well, exactly what, exactly what was said, exactly what was done. 
Exactly what do those people believe? You know, most people never even consider what someone else believes. And who do you think is responsible for that, that galvanization of turning people against each other? Certainly not people that love God, and certainly not people uh, that love other people, right? We need to come to a place where somebody can say, I'm Muslim, and you say, well, that's all right. I'm Jewish, well, that's all right. See, what we're about is facts, isn't it so? It's not about where you're coming from, it's about who God is. I remember the first time knocking on a door, and uh, I just, I don't, I came from Kansas. We don't have Muslims in Kansas. None. I remember the first time knocking on a door and a guy going, I'm Muslim. And I didn't know what to say. You know, it's like, hey, you know what, I want to, want to know if you'd like to hear about eternal life. And, well, I'm Muslim. So I said, well, you still need to get saved. He said, that's what my friend says. And we got in a conversation about the gospel. Being Muslim doesn't mean you... It means you're born into a particular group of people. That's what that means. That means you don't need to get saved. It doesn't mean that Islam is the truth. You know, but the Muslims would have you to believe that you can't consider anything unless, it's, unless they're Muslim. Isn't it true? And the particular sect of Muslims would have you to think that you can't dialogue with the other sect of Muslims. But my friend, one of the things that you and I have to understand is that I'm not threatened uh, by alternate truth. Well, there is an alternate truth, but I'm not threatened by alternate belief. If what I believe is true, it'll stand against a challenge of alternate truth. Isn't it so? Listen, if Jesus is the only way, then He's the only way. And if He isn't the only way, or if there's another way, He isn't the only way, and so I'm not threatened by hearing somebody else's version of what the way is. Let's get to the facts. Let's find out if that's really true, what you believe. Let's talk about it. Let's look at the historical evidence. Let's look at these things. And you know something? Truth always withstands the test. And I want to be right. I don't just mean I want to be the person who's right, who wins the argument. I mean, I don't want to be wrong and stand before God. And I really appreciate Paul's tone here. Because the first thing that he does is he explains to them, I get where you're coming from. You know, somebody tells me, I'm Catholic. I say, I get where you're coming from. I know what it is to be Catholic. I never was Catholic, but my family, we've got a lot of Catholics in our family. And I know how you got to be a Catholic, if I could guess. Do you mind? Mind if I guess how you became a Catholic? You were born. That's how you got to be a Catholic. Now, I don't say it in a... I have a sarcastic tone when I speak in a group. But I just tell people, you know, most people I know that are Catholic actually became Catholics because when they were a baby, their mom or their dad made a decision for them. And they became officially part of the Catholic Church just because they were born into a Catholic family. But what about somebody that wasn't born into a Catholic family? What if Catholicism was the only truth for anybody and you didn't happen to be born into it? Then what? See, it's, it's helpful, isn't it, to ask that question? What if I were born in India? What are my shots at being Catholic if that's the truth? Uh, we have some hate religions today. This tragedy that happened in New Jersey, uh, the, what is it, the week of Charlie's wedding, just a couple of weeks ago, where these people went into this uh, deli and, and murdered, uh, murdered some people. You know, it looks like I've read up on it as much as I can to try to figure out what it was. Of course, the media never wants to call anything terrorism, but it looks as, as though the Hebrew Israelites are starting to actually kill people now. The Hebrew Israelites are not Israelites who are Hebrews. They are hateful people who claim that the Jews that have always been known to be the Jews aren't actually the Jews. And it's a racial religion. It's a religion to hate people who are, well, in this case, actually Jewish. It's terrible, isn't it? And a religion, my friend, is evil. And religion oftentimes excludes, it doesn't include. Let me tell you something. If God's the creator of all men, then who does it make sense that God wants to include? Huh? All men. You find me, you find me a religion that shows that God loves all men. And it at least has the first step right in who God actually is. A God who loves some and hates others is not God. By the way, that's why, uh, that's why Calvinism is one of the reasons it's really evil. 
You say, Pastor, that isn't what they teach. You have to relate to Listen, you can't nail down a Calvinist individually on what they believe, but you can read up on a lot of them, and it is factual to say that God chooses some and God rejects others. And my friend, a God who loves some and hates others isn't the God of the Bible. That's right. That's all there is to it. I'm not going to get into it heavily, but that's, that's a place we ought to agree. It's that a real God who really made all men doesn't hate some races. I don't like using the term race, but that's the term that's used oftentimes. Hates some groups and loves others. That's not God. God loves all men. So Paul here, though, is relating to his brethren. And he goes on to say, I verily, it means truly, I'm verily a man which am a Jew. He said, you're Jewish, I'm Jewish. I use that with the Jews sometimes as well because there's a little bit of Jewish heritage in, in our family. My grandma was a layman. So people say, well, I'm Jewish. And I'll say, well, we can't help that, can we? You know, same thing happened to me. You know? Um, in other words, you're not going to listen to me because... And I'll ask people, so you, you're saying that you're not willing to, you're, you're not going to use your brain because of your ethnicity. Is that what you're telling me? This is my background. Paul is saying to him, hey, well, I'm Jewish. If you're going to say that not believing in Jesus is the, is, is, uh, you know, being Jewish means you can't believe in Jesus, well, I'm Jewish and I believe in Jesus. He goes on to say, I can relate to you. And matter of fact, he goes further than that. He says in verse 3, he says, I was born in Tarsus. In Cilicia, he said, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. He gives them the benefit of the doubt in the area where they should be right. In other words, if they're zealous of the law, is that good or bad? Good. That's actually good. And so Paul said, you know what? I grew up under Gamaliel. Now everybody who knew who Gamaliel was, he was the great Jewish teacher. Most people didn't sit under the feet of Gamaliel. You had to have qualified. And you had to have been one of very few that could sit under Gamaliel. And so here he's not being a snob, but he's simply saying, if you're going to pull the whole Jewish card on me and the whole we keep the law of God card, I studied under Gamaliel. Is that, are those good credentials? In other words, he doesn't refuse to talk to them on their level. He talks to them every bit that he can on their level. And he goes on to say, and he said, I can relate to what you're doing. I understand what you're doing. I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Now, <laughs> y'all don't like Christians. Well, let me tell you about me. I arrested people and brought them into prison. I helped kill Stephen. So Paul here is relating as much as he can. Do you know something? If you try to share the gospel with someone and they don't want to talk to you because they think you're a religious nut, can you relate to them? I don't like religious nuts, do you? You know, sometimes I tell people, you know, I just want to be straight up with you. I'm a religious nut. And I don't like those. Actually, I'm not a, really a religious nut. I, I just believe in God. I believe the whole Bible. I believe all of it. And I'm, so I'm a zealot in that sense. I mean, I really am. But you know what I tell people? I hate religion. If you don't like religion, here's what I hate about religion. Whenever I share the gospel, almost any time I tell people, listen, I'd like you to listen to me, but I want you to know where I'm coming from. I think I'm coming from the same place you are. I don't like religion, do you? Most people don't want to talk to you because they don't like religion. Well, I don't like it either. I can't stand the notion that someone would hold the power of eternal consequence over someone else to either control their pocketbook or to get a following and to empower themselves. But that's what religion actually does. Religion puts people under its thumb so that it can use them for its own benefit. And I hate that. I don't like it at all. You show me a religion where you can't think for yourself, but you have to accept what the leaders say, and I say it's a cult. That's right. You show me a religion where you can't disagree with the pastor or you can't open the Word of God and know what God says yourself, where you can't have your own relationship with God or you've got to pray through someone or you've got to, you've got to go through certain steps like confirmation or last rites 
or something in order to get confirmed with God that you're bona fide by man's endorsement. And I say to you, that's a cult. I don't like religion. Any kind of religion. Religion is all about self-empowerment of the leadership and it's about oppression of the people who are its devotees. The most heartbreaking things I've ever seen are devoted people who are under the thumb of religion. Remember some years ago, being down in Guyana, South America, where there's a large Hindu population, and seeing a devoted man get up in the morning and do devotions to a rock on a jack stand. That's literally what it was. It was like a little rock sitting on a jack stand. And the guy would get up every morning and worship it, and it was just, it was just heartbreaking. He was as devoted as he can be. This last year, Melissa and I were in Greek, and we were up in, in uh, uh, Meteora, this place where they have all these nunneries on the top of these rocks jutting out of the mountains. And it's really stunningly beautiful the way that God's made it. It's incredible that anybody's built a monastery up there. We were in a chapel, and I watched this elderly woman who was struggling even at her age to be able to move come into the chapel and with great effort by the help of her son get on her knees so that she could kiss the box that a skull of a monk was contained in. And I thought, how terrible to do that. To that. that woman was as devoted as she could be and she was under the thumb of oppression, under religion. I hate religion. And you notice when I talk to somebody, I want to know right away, I, you don't like religion? Let's just let's get together and rant about it. I don't like it either. I tell people I'm pastor of a church that, I, that, that has no tolerance for religion. You start bringing religion into this church, my friend, you'll find a very impatient leader in this place. I don't like it. So relate to people when you can. When someone's right, when somebody's speaking truth, say, well, that's right, I agree with that. Find common ground. That's precisely what Paul's doing here. He goes on to say, he said, uh, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I receive letters unto the brethren. Paul is not just saying, I sat on the feet of Gamaliel. He's saying, I persecuted Christians. And buddy high priest over here can tell you so because he's the one that gave me the credentials to kill Christians. He's saying things which cannot be argued. He's, he's not making up things. He's speaking the facts. And he is helping people understand, you, you persecute Jesus Christ, I know where you're coming from. Now, knowing where someone's coming from doesn't mean it's the truth. And here is where Paul gives them that I know where you're coming from. I came from the same place, but then I was faced with truth and I had to deal with it. And he talks about the conversion that we read about in Acts chapter 9, when he's on the road to Damascus and he has, he has letters to bind people that are of the way so that he can bring them to Jerusalem and throw them in prison and how that he met the Lord and the Lord Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then he gives a, talks about how that he became a believer in Jesus and how that following his becoming a believer in Jesus, God called him to the gospel preaching ministry. And then we come to something. See, whenever you give someone the truth and you give it in the right way, you give it, get an audience, I believe. But you also come to the point of decision where a person determines whether or not they'll have open eyes and open ears. You know, the fact is that people are closed-minded. People are closed-minded. You know, to assume that somebody believes what they believe because of something is closed-minded. I saw a bumper sticker yesterday on a, on a vehicle that related two things. It wanted to have the the equal sign on it, you know, the equal sign with the rainbow, not really the rainbow colors, but different colors on it, that's saying that uh, that God endorses uh, men and men and women and women in a relationship that actually God doesn't endorse. And also had something on it that said something like, uh, you're a president, uh, you know, if you elect a racist president, you're a racist. <coughs> So essentially, anyone today who supports the president of this country, which would mean at least an electoral majority, is a racist. And the assumption is because that person in that, that has that car, the assumption is that anyone who doesn't agree with them is a racist. 
that's not very open-minded, actually. Do you know that you might be a racist and I could still be your friend? I'm just, I'm just telling you. You know, you could be a racist and that doesn't mean I have to hate you. Does that make sense? I, I mean, my hating you isn't going to fix your hatred, hateful problem if you're a hateful person. My hating you could be anything, and just because you're that doesn't mean that any association that I make with you is the same. So assuming that what they're saying is true about the person they're saying about it, they're saying everybody that supports... Well, you know what that leaves in common with other people? Nothing. It's a blanket indictment. And you know, Paul here is being very careful not to make blanket indictments. He's saying, you hate Jesus? I hated Jesus. You are devoted to the law? I studied under Gamaliel. The high priest knows me. Knows who I am. I'm not making this up. He actually has done something very clever. The person who's responsible for subordinating or for causing this, this whole protest of Paul, Paul has just called as a witness to his devotion. And, they, and he can't deny it. Literally, the person who's raised up the people who has caused the whole problem, the high priest, Paul says, the high priest knows me. He knows I'm not that guy uh, that was a Gentile that was led 5,000 vagabonds or whatever. High priest knows me. And he's using facts. And Christian facts are everything. You know, some believers aren't very open-minded to facts. I met some Christians. You have your predisposed bent to believe whatever. And it may not be about the gospel, but it's about doctrine or it's about the church. And you're so predisposed with your bent that you, facts wouldn't sway you. Because you're closed-minded. And shame on a closed-minded people. Let's look at an example of those next. Now, would you please? Paul finishes his testimony. Look at verse 19. He said, I said, Lord, they know that I am present. This is when he's called to be a, a, a preacher of the gospel. Lord, they know that I am prison and beat in every synagogue them that believed on Thee. And when the blood of Thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Now, pay attention. This is interesting. Verse 22, the Bible says, They gave him audience unto this word and then said, Away with such a fellow from us, for it is not fit that he should live. These individuals listened to Paul until he said one word and it triggered them. Talk about triggered. Gentiles! Kill him! He said the word Gentiles. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> is the existence of Gentiles and the acknowledgement of such people cause of death what do you call that prejudice. that's pretty strong prejudice isn't it it's hatred is there anything more hateful than wanting to kill somebody because they're Gentile or because they said the word Gentile is there anything more hateful than that you ever thought of what of what your hatred towards something actually is in God's eyes who made the Gentiles the same person that gave the law to Moses made the Gentiles. And who made Abraham, who gave the covenant promise to Abraham that out of his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed? By the way, nations means Gentiles. Who made the Jews a blessing to the nations of the earth? God did. You know why? Because God loves Jews. And because God loves Gentiles. It's important for we as believers to understand that you had better not just go with a wholesale crowd or a group of people that think a certain way because that's what the cultural norm is. Norm is you better find out what God thinks and go with that. Here are individuals that literally want murder. You think about the hatred in the heart of somebody that wants somebody else dead. Now, I just want to tell you something. There's people that say, Pastor, you're, you're a mean guy. I'm not really a mean guy. Never tortured an animal, and I treat my wife nicely. But uh, I can be frank. I can be very blunt 
about things sometimes. People, oh, you know, you're, I, try, I try to speak the truth and I try to speak it clearly enough that people know what I said. I'm going to tell you something. I wouldn't want anyone in the world to die and go to hell. You say, Pastor, what about Osama bin Laden? Wouldn't want him to die and go to hell. He'd want me to die and go to hell, but I wouldn't want him to die and go to hell. You understand what I'm saying? What if somebody really hated you? Listen, nobody's ever hated me enough for me to want them to burn in hell for eternity, and that's a reality for people that don't know God. Do you know something? God Himself doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell. There are some grievous phrases, and I'm preaching not to the lost people here, I'm preaching to save people. So, right, so let's, let's stick with our audience in our application today. There are some grievous phrases in Christianity. One phrase that irritates me is, I'll pray for you in a disagreement. I always ask, what will you pray, kindly say? What will you pray for me? Somebody said this to me last week. They said, I'll pray for you. What are you going to ask God to do for me? You're going to pray for me to be blessed? You're going to pray for God to kill me? You're going to pray for God to send me to hell? What are you praying for? What does that mean when somebody says, I'll pray for you when they're not happy with what you said? Or they disagree with you and they don't have an argument, so they say, I'll pray for you. Well, I'll pray for you. Well, it's very, not only, not only is it condescending, but it's probably very insincere. I question whether the person actually does pray for me, and if they do, I wonder how much love is in their prayer. God, would you please be good to this person I hate? The Bible says we're supposed to bless them that hate us. We're supposed to bless those that persecute us. Is that what you're praying? You feel persecuted by me? Are you praying for God's blessing in my life? Because if I pray for you, that's what I'm supposed to pray for. I'm supposed to love my enemies, aren't you? You despise me, I'm supposed to pray for you. Hey, Christian, let me ask you a question. You ever been guilty of that? I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Sort of like the missionary's prayer. Remember this a couple years ago? This has gone away, but for a while it used to drive me crazy when uh, missionaries would put the little quotation, Ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And you read the rest of the verse, it talks about you know breaking them with a rod of iron and dashing them in pieces. And so forth. Now, well, you're going to be a real missionary to the lost world. <laughs> you know, go and destroy them. Uh, no, my friend, uh, we need to preach the gospel of Christ. We need to preach it in love. And you know, a, a phrase like that, even for other Christians, I've had other people say this. You know, well, then you're, it's something to the effect of, well, if you believe that, you're going to hell. Well, actually, I'm not. I'm going to heaven for one reason. That's because Jesus died on the cross for my sin, and I received the free gift of eternal life. And I'm not going to heaven because I'm good. Uh, I, I live for Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. But the only reason I am saved and have received the mercy of God is just because of His, because of the free gift of eternal life. You know, Christians who disagree doctrinally are very, very quick sometimes to just send other people to hell. And, and, and you know, you, you almost want them to go to hell because you don't want somebody alive that disagrees with you. That's wicked, actually, isn't it? When we see something here, don't we, with unclouded minds, we see Paul say the word Gentiles and people say, kill him. Because he said the word Gentile. Friend, Gentiles exist. There are some people who are so closed-minded they don't want to believe anything even exists that they're not for or that they can't deal with the existence of. And you know, that ought to be a part of any kind of Christianity. Say, Pastor, Gentiles are heathens. Yeah, but they could be saved. Anybody can be saved. You have the right attitude, the right mindset. You know, Paul, do you think Paul ever loved Gentiles before he came to Jesus? He didn't even love Jews that believed in Jesus. Paul was filled with hatred. And that brings us to our conclusion here today. And that's to ask this question, which I think is a real diagnostic. You know what intolerance actually is? Hatred. Intolerance is actually hatred. Now, by tolerance, I'm not teaching it the way the world teaches it because intolerance the way the world teaches is the most intolerant thing there is. When people talk about intolerance, what they're talking about is their acceptance of any kind of a 
absolute morality. For instance, if I say God says marriage is, then I'm told that I'm intolerant. And there is no room for my viewpoint. There are people who think that Christians ought to be put to death today for believing what God says about things. That's just a fact. And that's not tolerant, my friend. That's very intolerant. That's hateful. You know, I don't want anybody to be put to death for anything. Now, I don't, I'm not here today saying I disagree with God about capital punishment. I believe in government. I believe in, the, I believe in God's justice or government that reflects God's justice. I do not believe our government is Israel. However, we're not Israel. We're America. And uh, a nation doesn't get saved. Individuals get saved. And so a nation can be a Christian nation because it's comprised with believing individuals. So you can be known as a believing or a Christian nation. But the nation isn't saved. Just like the church organization isn't saved, it's the people that are saved. And we as believers ought to have no room for any kind of hatefulness. Any kind of a hatefulness. This whole, you said Gentile, you should be killed. Kind of a thing. It's amazing when you ask, what should be done with the people who disagree with you? It's very insightful to ask that question. What should be done with people who disagree with you? And it's, it's basically like this. They should be forced to agree or they should be eliminated. And eliminate is a nice word for murder. You know, it's not at all what a believer in Jesus Christ is. Listen, my friend, if you have the natural love of God in your heart, I'm talking about the fruit of the Spirit in your heart, these attitudes shouldn't show up. I've had, I've had Christians, I've heard express hatred toward homosexuals. My friend, you didn't get that from God. You didn't get that from God. Sin is sin. But you didn't get hatred from God. Didn't get it from God. I've heard Christians express hatred for people who don't toe the line with their personal beliefs. You didn't get that from God. They didn't get that from God. One of the things that we learned first of all, hey, hey, Mike, you're you're making uh, noises when you snore. Uh, <laughs> the, one of the things that we've learned from uh, well, one of the things we should have learned today is how that we ought to be able to relate to people, right? We ought to just be able to listen. If you came from where they're coming from, don't tell them how awful they are. I, I don't want, I, I don't want to elaborate on this anymore. But I've met some. Dear Catholic believing friends who got saved, and they're so angry at the lies that they were taught in Catholicism, and it's like they hated all the Catholics. Without thinking, you were duped, and so could they be. That's Paul's attitude was, I was duped. I found out the truth. And he's very compassionate toward his countrymen as a result of it. Now this is an evolution for Paul from what we saw a few weeks ago, isn't it? When he said, you know what? Your blood be on your hands. From henceforth, I, I go to the Gentiles. Now, here we see Paul having come full circle to wanting his brethren, his countrymen, to be saved and appealing to them in every way possible. He's met by hatred. The response is a hateful response, but that has nothing to do with the obligation that he had to preach the gospel in the right way. So, uh, two things this afternoon uh, as we conclude is this. How do, you, how do you present the gospel of Jesus Christ? How do you relate to others, even those who disagree with you? Can you find a place to agree? Can you find a place to say, I understand where you're coming from? It doesn't mean you have to compromise truth. But you're not going to get to speak truth until you can understand where somebody is coming from or until they listen to you. You can't get someone to listen. Then, my friend, you can't, you can't present truth or challenge them with truth. And I wonder today how many of those individuals who left there after what Paul had said went home and had to deal with the fact that, you know what, he felt the same way I do, but he came to a different conclusion. Why was that? If I'm right, and, and, and he thought he was right, and he changed, could I be wrong? You know, you can just get somebody to consider that. They might, they might come to faith in Jesus Christ. And the second thing is this. You know, as believers, there's no room for that kind of an attitude among us. The most open-minded people in the world ought to be believers in Jesus Christ. Listen, truth is not threatened by any alternate. Truth is never threatened by an alternate opinion. Somebody shares something with me, it's not true. I know the facts, I know why it's not true. It doesn't bother me. 
If I don't know the facts, and it might be true, I explore it and find out whether I'm, I'm in error. And you as a Christian ought to be open-minded. I'm not talking about just, oh, I believe this. Oh, I believe it. Don't just believe everything. But, but listen and examine. I don't have a heart of hatred. There's no room for hatred among believers. We not only love each other, but we ought to love the lost. Because that's what Jesus did. God, I just thank you so much for what we've learned today in the Scripture. I pray that it would impress us. And Lord, even though it's a somewhat different message today, the example of your servant Paul is one that we need to follow. And I pray that you would help us to see it as such. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We won't have a usual invitation this morning. I think everybody knows how to respond individually to the message. And so you're dismissed.